So how are y'all doing? Oh, surely you can do but I mean, I'm pumped to be here today. I don't know about you guys. I was telling somebody that I woke up this morning, I was like, I do not want to be awake. And then I got to church, and about 45 minutes before church service, now I am excited, so I hope you are too. But <clears throat> I'm getting over a little cold, so if I cough here and there, it'll be, you'll know why. Um, in your seat or in the seat next to you is a little card that's an Easter invite card. And I want to encourage you to take this card and at least give the one out that you sat on. If you want to get more, you can have as many as you'll give out, but it really does matter. I just want to encourage you that, that Easter is a time when people will potentially give church a chance and come hear the, the good message of, of Jesus Christ when they wouldn't otherwise, and you can really change somebody's life. You can change their eternity. So invite friends, family, people you don't even like, invite them to our Easter service. All right, well, let's get started. Um, do you know what this is? A box, and I've been prepared. It happened first service too. I was prepared for that. What's in the box? Yeah, well, a water bottle, but if you guess water bottle, you're actually wrong. It is a smart water bottle with TDH sensing and hydration AI tech. I don't even know what that means, but I love it. This, let me tell you a little bit about this water bottle. This water bottle has a travel-friendly silicone loop. In case you want to wear it like a holster and a gun, you can wear it on your belt. It's got medical-grade stainless steel because you need that in a cup. It's got dual wall construction. It's got anti-slip groove so it doesn't slip out of your hand. It's got water quality safety sensor. I guess so that the filtered water I put in it from my house is make sure it's not bad for me to drink, I guess. It has a 360-degree LED light. Because you can't drink water out of a cup that doesn't radiate light in 360 degrees. It's got a water tracking sensor and a wireless charging station because everybody knows that water and electricity go together really well. So this is an amazing water bottle. It even has an app for your phone. I don't have an app. You don't have an app. My, My water bottle has an app. This was a present from my wife for Christmas. She got it for me because... I don't drink enough water, and I need to hydrate better, and I'll be more healthy, she tells me. But what else did you notice about that water bottle? Still in the box. And so in fairness, about three weeks ago, I saw it sitting in the closet unopened, and I wouldn't let anybody open it from then on because I'm like, that's going to be an awesome sermon illustration. But up until that, about two months, it had sat in the box. It's fair to say I have all the tools now to be a a consumer of water, lots of water. But the problem is, I don't like water all that much. And until I become passionate about hydration, all the tools and preparation are not going to make me a better consumer of water. I have to become passionate about being hydrated. And the reality is the same thing is true for us in the tools or the techniques for following Jesus. I can tell you all of the different things you can do to grow, and until you have a passion for Jesus, it's not really going to matter. I I can tell you the 10 tips for tithing. I can tell you the shortcuts for sharing your faith, the proper process for prayer, the basics of Bible study. But until you have a desire to follow closely after Jesus, those things aren't going to change how you act and how you live. Well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to John chapter 16. We're in a series called Death to Life where we are looking at some of the very last teaching of Jesus right before he goes to the cross. If you missed church last week or the week before, I would really encourage you to go back and watch those sermons because this sermon series, unlike a lot, are really built as telling one kind of story from the beginning to the end. And so, If you're here today for the first time during the series, you're going to understand most of what I'm talking about, but you'll get a better understanding of the process if you go back and watch those other messages. It's kind of like the sequel to a movie, right? Sequels are generally made where if you go see it without seeing the original, you're going to understand most of what goes on, but you're going to have a deeper understanding if you go back and watch the first one and see what happened. We just did that with the movie Dune. My wife and I went back and watched the first one again before we went and watched the second one, which was awesome, by the way. And, but you get a better understanding. But let me give you a brief recap of the sermon series up to this point. In the first week, we talked a lot about who Jesus is. He, and we talked about why the religious leaders in, in, in Israel wanted to kill him, because he said some really uh, difficult things. 
And we talked about Jesus in his own words said that he is the truth. He is the life. He is the way. And we talked about what does that mean for us? And so we broke each part of that down and we talked about what it looks like to have this abundant life that Jesus offers through who he is. And then the second week, we talked about his parable of the vine and the branches and about the kind of relationship that he wants to have with each one of us. And we talked about how that you can't have this abundant life that we talked about in week one without having a relationship with Jesus that is deeper than just like a Sunday morning relationship. And as we've gone through this series, we've kind of used two terms to talk about different places where we are in our walk or our faith with Jesus. We've talked about people who are decided and people who are discipled. And the reality is that so many of you are kind of stuck in deciding. You decided to follow Jesus. Maybe you've been baptized. You come to church, but you've really never moved forward from there. And you've never become discipled. You've never made Jesus Lord and Savior of your uh, Lord of your life. You just made Him your Savior. And, and so, my goal in this series, and my prayer for you in this series, is that you move from decided to discipled, and you understand that following Jesus should impact every different aspect of your life. But for so many of us, we still follow in the category of decided. And so I want you to find the abundant life that we talked about in week one, this life that Jesus offers where you can be desperate for God. I know that feels kind of weird to say, to be desperate for something that you can't see, but that's the way the Bible describes the true relationship that we're to have with Jesus. The the psalmist says, like a deer pants for water, we are panting for Jesus. Because out of that desperation for Jesus comes a deep relationship. And out of that deep relationship, we find this abundant life that God talks about. And I want you to experience that. I want you to experience joy, even in difficulty, to have peace, even in loss, to find purpose even in suffering. And and so that's been my prayer for you guys for the last couple of months as we've gone into this sermon series. All right, let's dive into the teaching for today. So we talked about who Jesus is, then we talked about the kind of relationship that we need to have, and then this week we're talking about the power we can find to be transformed to find that abundant life. And so this teaching is kind of flowing out of even the teaching we were talking about last week. This is right before Jesus is arrested. They've already celebrated the Passover, what we call the the Last Supper. Judas has already left to betray Jesus to the Jewish leaders. And Jesus has been telling them, like we talked about last week, that he's going to leave them, that he's going away. And here he's telling them that he's going to go back to heaven, and they're all really upset about that. But look how he responds to them in our passage of Scripture. This is John 16, 5 through 15. But now I am going to him who sent me. Now, Jesus is saying here, I'm going to heaven. I'm going back to be with the Father. And none of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, you're filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly I tell you, it is good for you that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said to the Spirit, the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. So Jesus here is telling his apostles that they're going to get this gift of the Holy Spirit. And he says something that seems really odd. It just doesn't feel right to us. Jesus says, it's going to be good if I go away. How can that work? That doesn't make any sense. This is Jesus. This is God with us. This is the man who changed the course of human history. How can it possibly be good that he leaves? But but here's what Jesus was saying. He was saying that when he leaves and he goes back to heaven, that his apostles would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And here's why what he's saying is true. Jesus is Emmanuel. He is God with us. The Holy Spirit 
is God in us. God in us is even better than God with us. And here's why it works that way. When Jesus was in his ministry, he was the, the, the vessel of God. He was God in the flesh. And, and so, but it was just one person preaching and teaching. His apostles were following him around, but it was Jesus who was preaching with authority and teaching with authority. And he was the, the presence of God. But because he had limited himself as a man, he couldn't be in every place at once. He was in one place. But then when the apostles received the gift of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, suddenly the power of God was not in one person. The power of God was in 12 people. And they began to teach and preach with authority. And then every person that followed Jesus out of their preaching and teaching, they got the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the, and the power of God began to spread throughout the Roman Empire. And it spread all around the world and got even to Katy, Texas, where we now have the power of the Holy Spirit in us. See, this is a progression from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the power of God didn't reside in people generally. The power of God largely rested in the temple or the synagogue uh, or the tabernacle. The tabernacle is just like a moving temple. It's made of, of tents, but it's still like the temple. But there was a place in the very innermost part of the temple or the tabernacle called the Holy of Holies. And that's where the Ark of the Covenant stayed. You remember the Raiders of the Lost Ark, the Ark of the Covenant. And that's where the power of God generally resided. And the power of God would come on someone for a short period of time so that they could do something special, but it wouldn't stay with them. Look at an example of this. This is in Judges 15, 14 through 15. This is where the, the Spirit of God suddenly gives Samson power. You guys remember Samson, really strong dude, Samson and Delilah? Here he's about to do something amazing through the Spirit of God. This is Judges 15, 14 through 15. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. The ropes of his arms became like charred flax, and the bindings dropped from his hands. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. So here we see the, the power of God or the spirit of God comes over him so that he could do something impressive, but then it left and went away again. And then when Jesus came, the power of God became moved with Jesus. Jesus became a walking, talking tabernacle of God. He was the presence of God. But now with the Holy Spirit... All of us are tabernacles of God. We are walking, talking temples of the Holy Spirit, so the presence of God travels throughout the world. Now, here's why that's such a big deal. Because for the good news of God, for the power of God to spread throughout the world as it has, it had to work that way. We had to have the presence of God so that we could carry that with us when we share the good news. And so every believer has the presence of God in them from the Holy Spirit. And we still have that today. I, I can just imagine having a conversation with Moses one day in heaven and saying, Moses, like how awesome was it that you got to be in the very presence of God there at the burning bush or when you were up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments? And Moses going, yeah, that's pretty cool. But how amazing was it to have the presence of God with you all the time with the Holy Spirit? Or, or me saying to Samson, Samson, how awesome was that to have the power of the Holy Spirit show up and give you the strength to fight a thousand men? And I'm going, yeah, it's pretty cool. But how was it to have the power of the Holy Spirit with you every day, all the time? See, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit, but so many of us, we really don't understand the gift that we have. We've never really taken it out of the box because we don't understand it. We know less about this part of the Trinity of God than the other parts, right? We know more about God the Father, God the Son, and less about God the, the Holy Spirit. And one of the reasons for that is many of us grew up in a church where we didn't really talk about the Holy Spirit a whole lot. That's My church didn't talk about it. It's, it's a part of God, but it kind of made you uncomfortable to talk about. He was like the weird uncle that you hope doesn't come to the family reunions. And then when he shows up, everybody's really uncomfortable until he leaves. That's kind of the way it was for so many of us in church growing up with the Holy Spirit. Now, for some of you, it was very different, and it was all about the Holy Spirit. Your, your church service was a bit like a, a chaotic circus, and he was the ringmaster making everything go, but that's the exception rather than the rule. For, for us, it's so difficult sometimes to, to rely on something that we can't see and that we can't touch. 
But the reality is there's a whole lot of things we can't see or touch that have a dramatic impact on our lives. When I was a kid, we had one TV. It was a little old bitty TV that sat in our living room. Maybe it was 24 inches or something. I mean, it was a horrible TV, but, but it was a TV. It was better than nothing. And, you know, we would all sit and watch TV in the evenings uh, sometimes together as a family. Well, at some point, my, dis- my dad decided that I watched too much TV. He had a PhD. He was really serious about me being very well read. And he decided I need to watch less t- TV and read more books. And so one day when I was at school, he took that TV and he hid it in the attic. And then when I got home, he told me that the picture went out and we couldn't afford another one. Now, my dad was a preacher, so I'm trying to understand the, the twisted logic of how he was not lying to me about that. And as best, best I understand it, the picture went out when he unplugged it from the wall was his thought process. But anyway, he put it up in the attic and tells me that I'm just going to have to read. So it worked. He uh, got me to read more. But what he didn't anticipate is I also began to tell all my friends that we didn't have a TV and we couldn't afford a new one. Well, my dad was the preacher of the the First Baptist Church there in this little town. And so it got back to the deacons that their pastor couldn't afford to have a a TV for his family. Oh, yeah, you know where this is headed. So that year, just before Christmas, uh, like December the 15th, there's a knock on our door and we open the door and there is this massive TV being pushed up the walkway by the deacons of our church. It was one of those old TVs that's kind of a wood frame that's like a big old piece of furniture. It was amazing. It was bigger than most people's TVs. I was thrilled. My dad was secretly uh, horrified. But they brought it in and it was, it was awesome. It was like, you know, my, my dad's hopes for me to read all the time disappeared, but so did that tv size hole in my heart. And we couldn't not use it because they'd been given to us by the leaders of the church. And he couldn't say it didn't work because it was under warranty. And, and so we were back to having a better TV than most people. Now, what was amazing about that TV, beyond just being big and awesome, was that it had a remote control. Which that doesn't sound like a big deal now, but at then, no one had remote controls. This remote control, it was like this big, and it only had like four buttons on the whole thing. It had an on-off button. It was the same button. You just pushed it. It had one button to change the channel. It would only go up. But the good news is we only had three channels, and one of them we didn't get very well. So we didn't take long to scroll through the channels. It did have two buttons, one for volume up and volume down. But the amazing thing about that remote control is that I could be about 15 feet from the TV, and I could push a button, and you couldn't see anything, but the TV was affected. Now, Today, we don't think much about remote controls. Our lives are filled with radio waves and microwaves and all different kind of invisible signals that make our devices work, that make our cell phones go, that make our TVs work, that make our popcorn pop in the microwave. All of those things are invisible powers that affect your life in a pretty dramatic way. And the same thing is true for the power of God through the Holy Spirit. We can't see him, but we can certainly feel his power and his presence. If you read the book of Acts and you see the the New Testament church, they were dependent on the Holy Spirit. He was a part of every single thing that they did. Today, I think so often as churches, we have a real tendency to rely on our own power and to do things out of our own abilities and out of our own strength. Here's how the the great preacher and author A.W. Tozer says it. If the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would even know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. As a church, we've got to decide whether we're going to continue to rely on our own strength and our own power or we're going to rely on this supernatural power that God gave us to fuel life change. See, when we decide to follow Jesus, we're given this gift of the Holy Spirit. But we still have to decide to rely on it. We have to choose to release its power. We, listen now the Apostle Paul says this in Ephesians 5.18. He says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. What he's saying is you have a gift of the Holy Spirit, but you got to take it out of the box and use it. Just like that water bottle. I'm not more hydrated by that water bottle being in a box. I have to take it out and use it and put it to work. And so what Paul is saying here is we tend to rely on our own strength for comfort, 
We also tend to rely on other things. And he uses wine here as an example. But he could have put a lot of different things there that we tend to go to for comfort and for strength. He could have said your spouse. He could have said your career. He could have said your finances or your physical fitness. He could have said a half gallon of cookies and cream, bluebell ice cream. We go to those things, but he's saying where we should go is the power of the Holy Spirit. We have to release it. We have to access it, and we do that by growing in relationship with Jesus. And that's why for the last couple of months now, we've been praying differently as a church. Your church leadership, we've been praying urgently and passionately that we would have a a desperation for God that God's priorities would become our passions, that we would be fueled to be moved by the Holy Spirit. That's why we've been fasting on Wednesdays, and a big group of us have been meeting here at the church and praying on Wednesday night, praying that we would be a church and a people that are desperate for God, that are moved by God. That's why we're praying differently in our community groups. That's why we're doing 21 days of prayer as we lead up to Easter because when we begin to pray in desperation for God to show up, God shows up and does amazing things. We have to have a desperate nature for God. We get the power for life change from the Holy Spirit. So the more time we spend in prayer, the more time we spend studying God's word, the more we become filled with the Holy Spirit. The more we serve people in Jesus' name, the more we give back to Jesus and trust God with our finances, the more we do those things, the more we worship together and we corporately just cry out to God and praise him and glorify him, the more filled with the Holy Spirit we become. Then we can draw on his strength to be transformed as individuals and to see life change in other people through our church. Look at Romans 15, 13. This is Paul's prayer for the church in Rome about how the Holy Spirit would impact them. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Out of that power of the Holy Spirit, you find hope and peace and joy and all of those things that we talked about. And that's my prayer for you as individuals is that you would find that abundant life through the Holy Spirit. And and it's our prayer, my prayer for our church, that he gives us the power so we can make a God-sized impact in the world around us. You know, part of what I think holds us back a little bit in following uh, Jesus closer and and really relying on this strength of the, the Holy Spirit is that we don't really even understand it very well. We don't really understand what this power is. So I want to talk about that for just a minute. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for spirit is ruach. And then in the New Testament, the Greek word for spirit is pneuma. And the root of both words is essentially the same. It means a breath of wind. And so the the Holy Spirit, the power of that can be likened to a breath of wind. Listen to how Jesus says this in John 3, 8. He says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. This idea of the Spirit is the wind. We can't grab it, but we can feel it. It's insubstantial, but you know it's there. You can feel its power. I, I think about this like a sailboat that we are the boat being pushed by the power of the wind. I think about that as individuals and us as a church. We want to not move under our own power, but we just want to lift our sails up and catch that power of the Holy Spirit and be driven to speeds and accomplish things that we never could have accomplished on our own. But it's a mistake to just think about the Holy Spirit as this power source because it's not. It's wrong to think about it as an it. I mean, sometimes we, we think about it that way because we talk about it as a power source, but it's a he. The Bible is very clear that it's a person and it is a part of God. And we see that by what Jesus says. Look back at verses 13 and 14. Look at what Jesus is saying here about the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to read it to you. I've just highlighted for you the the synonyms or the, the pronouns. I can't even think of the word. He, 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 he. Jesus is making it very clear that this is not just a power source. This is a person. And so you got to think about the Holy Spirit as a constant companion, a source of strength and comfort and energy. And when you understand that he is a person and a part of God and that he is a comforter and, a, and giving you strength, you can begin to experience that more. 
And Jesus actually talked a lot about the Holy Spirit throughout his last teaching because he was trying to get his disciples prepared for him leaving and the Holy Spirit arriving. And so I want to jump back two chapters to John chapter 14. It's the, where we started the first week. And look at what Jesus says there about the Holy Spirit. This is John 14, 16 through 17. And I will ask the Father... And he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. He's talking about the Holy Spirit here. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. That is such a key. It is saying that God through the Holy Spirit is with us, in us, for us. And what that means is as followers of Jesus, we're never really alone. And I think sometimes when there's nobody around, we think of ourselves as being alone. But if you are a follower of Jesus and you've tapped into this power of the Holy Spirit, you're never truly alone. And I want to talk to some of you that may feel very lonely right now. Maybe you're watching online and you haven't kind of gotten the courage up to come to church in person. And so you're watching in a house all by yourself. There's nobody around and you feel very alone. When you follow Jesus, you're not alone even when there's nobody around. You have the God of the universe that's there with you. Some of you may be in a different situation. You may live in a house with a spouse or with kids or your parents, and yet you feel very alone. I, I think sometimes the most lonely we can feel is when we live in a house with other people, but there's no communication, no love, no care. God did not make us to be alone. He made us to be part of a community, to support one another, to encourage one another, to love one another, to challenge one another. But maybe that's not the season you're in and you feel very alone. The hope for you is this. You're never truly alone. The God of the universe is always with you, always in you through the Holy Spirit. But we're also here for you as a church. I would encourage you, if you're watching online, you can email us and we pray for you. You can go to the internet and you can check our website out. You can contact us. Tell us what's going on in your life. We'd love to pray for you and encourage you. But I'd also challenge you to, to step out of your comfort zone and come here and meet this group of people that loves God a lot and loves one another and supports one another. But it's this huge thing about the Holy Spirit is he is with us. He is our comforter. Here's another important thing to understand about the Holy Spirit. He's the part of God that convicts us about our sin. He reminds us of the righteousness of Jesus, and he reminds us of the coming judgment of Satan and the world. Look back at verses 8 through 11. Here's what Jesus says. When he comes, he will prove the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. So he's talking about some different roles of the Holy Spirit. And he says one of them is to convict the world of their sin. We live in a pretty sinful world. And the biggest sin in the world is not believing in Jesus. And, and that's where the Holy Spirit comes in with the world. So when we tell someone about Jesus, we share the good news of Jesus with them, it's the Holy Spirit that softens their heart and prepares them to believe. Think about that. We are telling somebody that somebody dying on a tree 2,000 years ago, halfway around the world, impacts their life today. And people believe it. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is here today, and he works the miracle in their heart and makes it real. He reminds them that it wasn't just something that happened 2,000 years ago. It's something that changes lives today. That's the way the Holy Spirit works. That's his job. And the Holy Spirit also convicts followers of our sin. He, he reminds us of where we haven't measured up to the righteousness of Jesus. See, no matter how good a sermon I preach, no matter how many stories I tell or how hard I try, I cannot change your hearts. Now, maybe I can make you feel guilty for a little while, but I cannot change your heart. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. The Holy Spirit reminds you of what you're called to. He convicts you of the sin in your life. That's his job. And, and what I've been reading, because I, I've been passionate about us finding revival in this community, and so I've been reading about great awakenings and revival throughout modern church history and seeing what kind of happens when those occur. 
And what I've found is that in every one of those, repentance of sin is a huge part of that. And the Holy Spirit is where th- that he's the one that does that. He, he causes that in those moments. And I want to read one example of that. This was the great revival of 1860 to 61 in Great Britain. And this account was written by a high-ranking army officer who wrote about what he saw in his little Scottish town about this revival. He says this, those of you who are at ease have little conception of how terrifying a sight it is when the Holy Spirit is pleased to open a man's eyes to see the real state of his own heart. Men who were thought to be and who thought themselves to be good religious people have been led to search into the foundation upon which they were resting and have found themselves rotten. All that they were self-satisfied, resting on their own goodness and not upon Christ. Many turned upon open sin to live lives of holiness, some weeping for joy for sins forgiven. That's what happens when the Holy Spirit shows up. When revival happens, the people of God become very serious about the sin in their lives. And what I've learned from my own experience is that I'm a work in progress. I'm a lot more holy than I was 20 years ago. I look more like Jesus now than I did then. But man, I am not there yet. I'm still a work. And what I find is I'll, I'll conquer some sin, some, something that I need to fix. I'll get that fixed in my life, and I'm feeling pretty good about myself. And then Jesus will go, hey, what about that? What, what about that attitude that you need to change? What, what about that priority that you need to kind of switch? And I'm like, oh, no, not that too. But he's constantly reminding us of how we can look more and more like him. Now, we have a big church word we use for that. We call it sanctification. And sanctification is the process from which from the moment we follow Jesus, we make a decision, we become discipled, and we start to look, act, and speak more like Jesus. And you will be a work in progress until the day you die. That's how it works. And it's the Holy Spirit that reveals that sin to you and gives you the strength and the power to conquer it. The Holy Spirit is a companion and a helper for us as individual Christians, but he also provides the fuel source for our church to make a God-sized impact in the world around us. When Lil and I decided to start Kara City Church, God laid some pretty big missions on our heart. He wanted us to create a place where people loved one another in a different way, and I've already seen that happen. He wanted us to be a place that shows intentional grace to each other and to the world around us. And I'm seeing that happen. I'm seeing us become that kind of church. But the biggest mission he put on my heart is for Kara City to be a place where people are constantly deciding to follow him, to give their lives to Jesus. I want to see a day here where we're surprised when we don't have a baptism because it's just a constant process of people deciding to follow Jesus. But for us to be that kind of place... We can't do that in our own strength. We have to be fueled by the Holy Spirit. We have to find this power source that will guide us at speeds that we cannot reach on our own. So how do we make that happen? How how do we become filled with the Holy Spirit as individuals and as a church? We have to have a passion for God. We have to have a passion for Jesus. we we got to pray with urgency that God would give us his heart for his people, that his priorities would become our passions. And so I want to challenge you this week to pray that you'd be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're doing your 21 days of prayer, that's this week, that God's power would fill you to change your life, to help you to be the the husband or wife God's called you to be, the employer or the employee God's called you to be, the, the parent or child God's called you to be, that we would be changed and transformed. But then our church would help transform our city through the power of God. And I know that seems like a big mission for our little church to change the city of Houston. But remember, Jesus started out with 12 disciples, and they changed the world. God can do whatever he wants to do because he has a power we cannot understand. And that's why it's so important that we don't rely on our strength and our power because we don't have much. But God has more than we could ever use. So that's the prayer. Look, I get that some of you guys aren't comfortable praying. I I get that some of you really don't even know how to pray. And I understand that. But here's what I would tell you. Get out of your comfort zone and tell God you don't know how to pray. Go to God and say, God, I, I don't even know what I'm supposed to be doing here, but I'm talking to you. Help me understand how to pray. And do you know what? 
That's another responsibility of the Holy Spirit to take that prayer and translate it. Listen to this. This is what Paul says in Romans 8, 26 through 27. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Holy Spirit comes in there and he takes this prayer that you don't even understand and you're just like, God, I don't know what I'm supposed to be praying for. He knows what you need to be praying for and he helps you with that. Pray. Pray that you'd be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then get up and get involved in the mission. That's part of the process. Don't be a spectator. Be an active participant in watching Jesus do crazy big things in the world around us. Begin to live out the power of the Holy Spirit. Share your faith. Invite people to church. Be generous with your time, your talents, and your resources to help the ministry and the mission of Jesus through this church. That's what it looks like. I think there's a real tendency, and there's going to be a tendency for you to to start making excuses about why it doesn't make sense. You're going to say, look, I'm not really a good speaker. I don't really, I'm not good around people. I'm pretty private. I don't know much about the Bible. But the reality is, you don't have to know a lot to change people's lives. You just have to know Jesus. That's the bottom line. The famous preacher John Piper said it this way. You don't have to know a lot of things for your life to make a lasting difference in the world, but you do have to know the few great things that matter, perhaps just one, and then be willing to live for them and die for them. The people that make a durable difference in the world are not the people who have mastered many things, but who have been mastered by one great thing. If we pray for the power of the Holy Spirit, he will show up. And then we got to give out of our comfort zones to live like Jesus, love like Jesus, serve like Jesus, and share the good news of Jesus. And then we're going to see God do big things in our lives, in our family's lives, and in this church. So I want to wrap up this sermon a little differently. I want you to to go ahead and close your eyes, bow your heads. And I'm going to pray a prayer over you that Paul prayed for the church in Ephesus. He wrote it in the book of Ephesians. And and I want you to know that as I'm reading this scripture, I'm I'm not just reading scripture, but I'm praying this powerful prayer that Paul prayed. I'm praying it for you as individuals, and I'm praying it for us as a church. These are Paul's words in Ephesians 1, 17 through 21. I am asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for those of us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. This is my prayer for you individually and for our church, that you would understand the same power that God used to raise Christ from the dead that's available for you today. 